Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar with D3 Security and Recorded Future, Faster High Fidelity Investigations at Workshop uh, from our two companies. Um, my name is Alex McLaughlin. I'm the Marketing Director here at D3 Security. Uh, I'm just going to do a, a little bit of housekeeping uh, at the top of the call here before we get into the good stuff. So this workshop will be recorded and available on demand. Uh, we'll work to send it uh, as soon as possible, basically within a business day to um, everyone who signed up and everyone who's on the call today. So you'll have it available. Um, there will be a live Q&A session at the end. Uh, the exciting thing is that the best question from the audience will receive a $50 gift voucher. So uh, Christmas is right around the corner. You can use it for yourself or give it to someone else. Um, the point is ask some great questions, um, you know, challenge us with, with uh, difficult questions. That's what we like uh, best. Type them into the chat and uh, we will verbalize them uh, at the end of the Q&A. Um, you know, our panelists today uh, are Stan Engelbrecht and Luis Rodriguez. Uh, Stan, why don't you uh, turn the slide over? And uh, Luis, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, Luis Rodriguez, I'm a solutions architect with the Tech Alliance team at um, Recorded Future. So I'm passionate about helping uh, enterprise customers become, become more cyber resilient. One of the reasons why I like this, our partnership, and one of the reasons why I'm here is to talk about our Better Together story. So thank you for having me. Fantastic. Great. Yeah, thank you, Karen. You're up. Yeah, my name is Stan Engelbrecht. I've been with uh, D3 Security uh, over six years, coming up on almost seven. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Practice. Um, I've advised clients, uh, implementations, uh, really around the SOAR space, uh, and uh, just looking at how technologies uh, work together. And uh, just I'm really excited to be here uh, with Lewis from Recorder Future and showcase uh, what the two tools can do together and what we can bring to the table to really help uh, clients and uh, and people moving forward um, also on the response side, but also, you know, we'll talk a little bit on the proactive side of things as well. So at this point, I'll hand it over to uh, hand it over to Lewis and uh, Lewis, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, Recorder Future, we are a security intelligence platform. We are collecting data from over a million plus sources, and that's growing to the tune of 100 new sources on a weekly basis. We, uh, we structure that data, we analyze it, we provide Finnish intelligence. Uh, so we have a team of researchers, a distributor across the globe that is giving a context in the platform. And then we make that uh, intelligence available through our API, through integrations, through a portal, through browser extension, and also other products um, that, that customers can supply. It's all SaaS based. So uh, if you could move to the next one, Stan, next slide. Uh, for the context of cybersecurity, we're really um, focused on providing persistent and pervasive platform coverage, uh, giving you context about the adversaries and their intent, the infrastructure that they leverage, uh, and also the organizations that they target. Uh, here on the screen, you can see some examples of that data, and we're gonna dive, the, um, dive deeper in, uh, in a small demo here, showing you our Better Together story. So if you could go to the next one. Our differentiators are really uh, providing complete coverage, providing that coverage in real time. So every time there's an event process, we're leveraging mach machine learning to provide uh, really the analysis that needs to uh, be done in order to find these uh, entities or links uh, that we, we can then deliver attribution. So at the scale in which Recorded Future can, can process information is really one of our biggest differentiator. And also uh, we are very, uh, I would say maniacally focused on providing actionable information, minimal, meaningful in, insights uh, into the tools that you're, you're using today to make sure that we can provide a decision advantage. So with that, I think we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and give you a little bit of context about uh, today's conversation. So, and please, if you have any questions, uh, ask them in the chat. I'm sure Alex and Sam can help me when I'm doing the, the demonstration, so. Absolutely. 
Can everybody see my screen? It's coming through. Okay. So for the purposes of today's conversation, um, what you're gonna see in the D3 security platform is um, additional context from Recorded Future about an event that could be generated uh, from a SIM, for example, or uh, another, uh, another system. And that could be an alert, that can be an event log. Uh, what we're saying is that if you, if you have an incident that you need to research, and I'm gonna put my analyst hat on at the moment, you can see that, let's pretend that this is the IP that you're questioning, you're trying to research. Recorded Future can provide additional context. Our risk scoring, when it comes to IOCs, um, is a risk score from zero to 99, where 99 is the most malicious. You can see that we provide the evidence. We like to show our math, as they say. When we see an event that we attribute to that particular IP, like in this case, current command and control server, so that we have processed an event where we're sitting communication or maybe uh, uh, it, maybe we executed malware, for example, uh, that is saying that we have observed that there's linkages between and command and control server infrastructure and this IP. That's why there's very risky score. You also see historical events at recorded feature. We've been storing information for the last 12 plus years. Um, it means once we ingest something in the database, it, we retain it for historical purposes and it doesn't impact the risk score. But if you're doing analysis to make a decision, you can see here that it, there's a historical event linking this IP to an intrusion event. Um, you also notice that in the top, we provide uh, uh, mentions of INSIC notes. INSIC notes is our Finnish intelligence and Stan will cover that his part of the demo providing some of that context. Uh, here you can see a little bit of what that note is. It's basically some of our uh, research uh, that we make available in the platform. We also have other contexts like GOIP, CIDR details, um, other co-mentions in the database, and in some cases, linkages for uh, attribution for uh, threat actors, uh, TTPs, MITRE T codes that you'll see in some of the intelligence cards. So uh, with that context, I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it over to Stan so he can talk about how we can use this information in the D3 um, workflows. That's fantastic. Thanks, Louis. Okay, so let's head back uh, into the screen set here. So again, uh, Lewis gave a phenomenal overview in terms of what Recorded Future brings to the table when it comes to the intelligence side of it, especially in the research side. And we're gonna look a little bit now as to what uh, D3 brings to the table and how the two tools can work together. So I'll start with, um, you know, what D3 brings in terms of a um, security orchestration automated uh, response platform. So a couple of things where uh, there's differentiators between uh, D3 and, and other types of platforms. Um, oftentimes when you're dealing with events coming in from different sources, whether it's a SIM, whether it's an EDR or other, other types of tool sets like that, um, you're dealing with a one-to-one -one relationship or you're having to back search after it's already gone to a case. Uh, D3 has a concept of an event pipeline. The pipeline is really designed to take any type of an alert from any type of a system and then pass it through um, the pipeline, which does a number of different uh, pieces in terms of normalizing the data, allowing the data to be able to be deduplicated. But really importantly, in, in the third portion of it, um, we have the ability to pull in uh, additional threat intelligence. And this is really where um, having the capability of being able to pull really rich fidelity data from a tool um, like Recorded Future gives you the capability to really speed up your, speed up your investigations. And make very very quick decisions, um, you know, and automate those processes. Uh, if you're getting really good data co coming through, and you've got um, the confidence that um, Recorder Future brings to the table from its intelligence, it means that you can automate the process of going. Is this alert something I actually have to deal with? If it's coming back with all low and we've got a high confidence in that, we can simply dismiss it and the analysts don't really have to deal with it. Um, versus ones that come through, as, as Lewis pointed out, with a high risk score and high confidence levels, those are items that we want to push through the pipeline and, and automatically escalate either one or many into a case for handling so that the analyst can get to the work where where it's important and really protecting uh, protecting the, the, uh, the environments that, that they're dealing with. That's really the concept of, of, of the D3 pipeline. So talking about the integration side of it and, and, and 
Uh, we've got a really great relationship with Recorded Future. We already have, um, and this is only a snapshot, by the way, of the types of actions that can be done within uh, the current state uh, of our integration. I think there's something like 20, uh, 25 plus different actions that can be taken within the environment. Um, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about the end. We'll, um, there may be some questions in terms of um, other modules within Recorded Future, such as their uh, ASI module, which is their tax surface intelligence, or their identity modules, and what we're going to be doing with those. And uh, we've got some great plans coming up in the future for, for those types of things and integrating those tool sets. So this gives you a snapshot on what you can currently do within, within the tool set and, and what's coming within, within the system itself. Um, I'm going to move into a bit more of, of a live demo uh, situation here, but I wanted to walk through the use case that that we're going to be that we're going to be looking at. And Lewis already mentioned uh, some of it. So, the the idea of ingesting an alert, we're going to stick to um, a similar. As this is oftentimes on on recorded future side of it, the first point of integration, they're going to provide some intelligence coming into uh, the SIM system for that particular IP address and give some context around it. Um, what we want to focus on is after we've ingested that, what can we bring to the table and what can recorded future bring to the table in terms of really um, bringing in the extra intelligence and the work that Recorded Future does into the into the D three platform and how analysts can utilize that to very quickly make decisions and really um, not have to worry about, you know, how much time am I spending on gathering intelligence, but uh, centralizing all that workflow into a central workbench in, in D3. So the idea of the use case that's going to be coming across is we're going to look at an ingested similar. It's got a suspected bad IP address. We're going to pull additional record details. Um, from Recorded Future. We're going to look at uh, risk leveling. We're going to look at risk rules, which are really, really important, which Lewis already tied into for the risk mapping. And then we're going to look at what types of appropriate actions we can take um, at the end of that particular uh, that particular workflow. So uh, with that, I'm going to move uh, into the platform itself. And uh, I'm just going to stop, uh, stop the presentation. And we're going to look at items within the system here. So um, in uh, within the D3 platform, and Lewis, I'm just going to make you, make sure I'm honest here. Can you see my can you see my screen coming through? Is it not sharing? I can uh, see. It's sharing. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to start with a point of ingestion in, into the platform. So we've got an item. It's come through. It, it's actually a Microsoft Defender alert. Uh, it's come actually through Azure Sentinel that that we've integrated with, and we've brought in a number of pieces of of information um, into this particular alert. One of those items was this particular source IP address or external IP address that Lewis already talked about within 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 their within their context and within their platform. So we've taken this. Um, it's already been given a high risk. This is something that's come through. And now what we've done is we've taken this and we've escalated it into um, an incident for handling. So this is really now the case management side of of the D3 of the D3 platform. So moving into the actual case itself, we're going to take a look at um, items that um, are already there from an analyst uh, perspective. So one of the things we've done, and I'll, I'll open up a couple of different areas here. So first things within the description, this is the vetted analyst notes that uh, that Lewis talked about. Uh, we can bring those in automatically so that the analyst gets an immediate idea as to what's coming through in terms of the intelligence that Recorder Futures brought into the platform. So right away, they know, you know what, this is linked to some pretty serious um, items within, you know, within their intelligence. Um, they've, they've looked at, um, you know, it's, it's part of a, it's part of a rat command and control to C2 servers. Uh, it incorporates, you know, different types of networking communication through those controllers. So this is looking already like not a good thing. We've then tapped Recorder Future to bring automatically bring in also um, related entities from, from the system. So there's a related malware categories. We can, we can get a sense of, you know, additional items. We've got additional file hashes that, that have been brought through this area, additional, um, you know, information on related IP addresses and their counts have come in. So all this information can be brought in and tapped automatically from a quarter future into D3 as simply as part of as part of the workflow. So as as sorry, Lewis, did you have a uh, a comment there? Yeah, I just wanted to to provide a little bit more context. So mm -hmm. um, obviously, if we're following the workflow, uh, this is an event that was generated from the sim. It came over to the D3 uh, platform. 
The reason why this, what uh, Stan is showing is very critical is uh, in recorded future, what we consider links are relationships of different entities. That's something that is, is very unique to us uh, that we can do. So for example, those links can be associating that IP um, with a particular threat actor or with a MITRE T code or other IPs that have been observed as part of a campaign. And we can provide all the justifications and linkages. Um, so the, the workflow could be as simple as what uh, Stan is gonna show today, but it can also be modified to, uh, to do additional investigations. Uh, and in some cases we can also provide uh, hunting packs. So we can uh, do a workflow to, to do retroactive hunt or, or, or proactive hunt is better, uh, better explained with um, hunting packs that are provided from the recorded future platform. So just keep, the, keep in mind that this is what we can, we can do with the native integration, but the only limitation is, is our imagination, right? And, and the need of the customer. Absolutely. So I've showcased this in, in an area where it's presented immediately. I'm going to go into the, into the workflow. We'll take a look, look at, um, we'll take a look at how, what we got through the API calls and, and where that additional data is, is all coming from. So this is a, a, a really simple workflow as Lewis, as Lewis pointed out, and really um, it's really only up to our imaginations as to what we can do um, further on throughout, uh, throughout, throughout the area. So in, in this environment, what I've done uh, first is we've actually pulled in additional data. So that data that you've seen written in the tables we, we and the description wrote in here, but to give you the idea really of the scope of the data that we're able to pull through um, within, within the call for recorded futures, we can pull in, again, you're looking at overall, uh, you know, the risky CDI, CDIRs. Um, this is a really uh, large data set that we can that we can pull in. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different evidence strings that we can bring in, as as Lewis mentioned. You know, all this information is available to be used in different ways, and it's really only uh, it's only limited by our by our imagination for what we what we may want to do in terms of the actions that we can that we can take within within the system. Um, Again, MITRE TTP information coming through and the risk mapping, which is really important, which I'll show you what we're going to do here in just a little bit in terms of actually, you know, applying that automatically into the into the case so that an analyst doesn't have to search for this. We'll just automatically up the, update the case rules with with these types of items. But the fidelity of the data that's coming in and how we can use it is is just fantastic. So from here, we've pulled the data in. We've extracted it. You can already see here. Um, it's been automatically labeled as a high threat threat risk. Um, as an analyst, there's multiple ways I could do this. But if I go into like a task for review, for example, I can take a look at you know what are the risk rule mappings that were present. You know these were items that um, you know it's part of a current CNC um, you know serverless. It's recently been active. Uh, there's a sort you know there's there's historical reported uh, threat lists in the group. It's been re referenced here, so I can look at these and go, yeah, these are present and they're not looking good. And from here, I can then move the workflow through uh, in terms of you know what what needs to be done there. Um, I can I can pull in additional uh, TTP information and automatically update it within within the environment, so we can tag those items um, in in this particular area and have them automatically feed through both into our attack dashboard, but also within uh, the overview area. So it'll automatically update the TTP information. You can see it's been added in here in the incident. If we've got additional lower level sub techniques, we can we can go and grab those as well. But all the information can be brought in and, and centralized within within the environment. Additionally, um, this then leads to what do we want to do on the action side of things? So do we want to go and add associated um, URLs uh, into, into a block list? Do we want to go and uh, add associated IP addresses automatically into, into any type of a block list that, that we may have within the environment? So these types of commands can then be set up to automatically pull the data in from different areas and then basically push the workflow through however, however we may need to. Go ahead, Lewis. Did you have a, a, another comment there? No, I think there was a question. Oh. Uh, from yeah guys yeah. so yeah i've got a, a few questions here so the first one uh, will be for lewis um and there's two questions that i think they're kind of asking the, the same thing so the first one was what goes into a risk score like i think what how does a risk score calculate uh, and the the related question was do risk scores for the same ioc 
differ much across threat intelligence platforms? Yeah. So, okay. So the, the first question, as far as what goes into the score, every one of our uh, intelligence cards that has a score has a rule set specific to the type of event uh, or, or the type of entity uh, that we're analyzing. So for example, with in this case with the IP, the, the risk mapping that Stan showed means that we have matched uh, particular events saying where we've seen evidence of a command and control server um, traffic being sent to that IP. So that's a rule that we're monitoring for. If we see evidence of that, particular activity, then it influences the risk score. So every IOC intelligence card has a, um, a list of risk lists. In, in the case of IPs, there's 41 risk uh, rules that we're processing in real time. And that allows us to adjust the risk um, in real time. So that's why we see our intelligence cards and the data that you can pull as a real time reflection of risk. So hopefully that answers the first question. Let me know if there's any follow-up questions. When it comes to what makes you record a future different is um, a lot of our uh, competitors in the threat intelligence space do not provide uh, the real-time context that we do in a live risk score. They may say something is malicious and provide evidence and that evidence in some cases can be stale. Um, one of the, the benefits of record a future is that uh, as you continue to pull information or query our API, you're gonna get the latest uh, information uh, and the events that we've processed. So you can think of our risk score as a dynamic risk score that changes in real time as we're processing events. And that's very unique to record a future. Um, and that's why we like to say that we're an intelligence platform and we can offer intelligence in other areas, not just uh, a threat feed. Great, thank you, Lewis. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, Stan, does D3 integrate with Microsoft Sentinel? And maybe also touch on uh, some of the other integrations we have with Microsoft, because I know those are you know, growing in popularity. Yeah, so we are a MISA partner with Microsoft. So we integrate with Sentinel, we integrate with pretty much the entire Azure environment. Um, anything to do with the Active Directory side of things. So if if it's Microsoft, uh, anything that's within their Graph and Graph Security API, we fully integrate with. So, and if you if you want a full list of that, um, those are items that we can that we can supply uh, to you uh, for sure after the after the after the workshop here. That's uh, that's not a problem. Right. Um, and I just want to make sure that we answer the question fully. It was specifically about Sentinel. Sentinel. Uh, there are you know our connection available yep. for Sentinel already. So yeah. Yeah, there's fully connect. The fully connectors are are available. In fact, the this particular event is actually sourced through um, Microsoft Sentinel. So this was actually one that we we ingested from it. So it's it's part of the system. It's part of the system already within within the environment. Okay, I'm going to move on to another question. It in, it involves uh, both recorded future and D3. So Stan and Lewis, if you could read. I'll read aloud the question from Mithin, but if you could also take a look at it. So for, whoop, and just, just bear with me a second, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, for malware alert sandboxing, uh, how can Mithin use D3 and recorded feature together uh, to input the file, get a sandbox report, attach it to the D3 incident record um, using you know an automated process, whether that's, fully automated or, or partially automated? That's that's a great question. Maybe uh, I'll handle that for the first because that's actually a use case. Somebody's jumping ahead on us, Lewis. Like we had talked about <laughs> we had talked about doing this in another workshop and people are getting ahead of us. So uh, Mithin, uh, the way that it uh, would work, whether it's a URL or a file attachment, when we ingest into D3, uh, into, the, into the playbook structure, we'll track the URLs or the, um, or more importantly, any type of an attachment that may come in. So oftentimes, if I'll stick to the phishing side of it just to begin with. So if you're using like some type of a fish me reporter or something else like that, it'll forward as an attachment into the platform. And we can just simply pass that via API call into, into recorder future sandbox uh, environment. And then same the same way that we would get the fidelity of the data that we're getting out, even from this particular API call, uh, we can get the full threat report 
back out via the same thing. It would be structured. Um, we actually have clients on the sandboxing side of it, they actually attach the, the full report at, at on the attachment side of the investigation platform automatically within the system. So those items are uh, those items are actually things that we're going to showcase in a future webinar. So, uh, or I should say a future workshop on that side of it. So, um, yeah. Lewis, you want to maybe touch on, on recorded future sandboxing capabilities? Maybe a good kind of segue over there. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you're a recorded future customer, uh, you should have access already to the to the sandbox. Uh, you can uh, submit up to a thousand files uh, to the sandbox, and then we we also have a private offering. We have full set of APIs uh, to support the use case uh, that that Stan mentioned. Um, what we typically would see, or, or you know, one of the conversations Stan and I were having is um, on, on a workflow because we have the hash. Uh, intelligence, right? We also have a, just like we showed the uh, IP intelligence card, we have a hash intelligence card. So we can take the hash uh, even before detonating the file in the sandbox and say, does recorder feature have a risk score on the hash? Uh, if so, if, you know, let's assume it's malicious, then you don't need to submit a file for the sandbox. If we haven't, if we don't have a high risk score and we need to submit the file for the sandbox, uh, we can also do that and extract all the intelligence that our sandbox could generate to handle the uh, the phishing or the URLs use cases you're talking about. Our sandbox does support submitting file attachments uh, as well as URLs. So the uh, we can support the use cases that, that you're describing. Hopefully that answers the question. Well, they, they keep rolling in the questions. So, you know, that, that's Good what we're point. here to do. We're here to answer, answer questions. So, you know, any, any that we receive, we're going to address. So here's a good one. Can observed IOCs evolve over time? Uh, if we see a benign IP hit us, but then ramp up their malicious behavior over time, will that score be updated? And will this newly observed activity slash intelligence be shared back into recorded future automatically? It's one so, for Lewis. Uh, yeah, so on, on our side, yes, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, our intelligence cards uh, are updated as soon as we, we associate an event. So if, you, if, if in this playbook we modified it and we say there's an event involving this IP, let's go ahead and do a block. Um, but then we, you know, a day or two, somebody says, okay, let's go ahead and, and do an update. You leverage the API to get the risk score. That risk score may actually be higher. Um, if we haven't seen any activity over time, there's a temporal aspect uh, in the recorded future intelligence time. So there's a, a timer per se for, for the evidence that we're analyzing. If we haven't seen that um, repeat offense, uh, it will go down. So the, the risk score is always going up and down. And one of the reasons why we could keep the historical information, because let's say in the in the phishing use case that uh, Mithum uh, suggested, there might be an event that gets um, that it has a, an IOC, a URL, or an Apex domain that is very low risk score, um, but because of the content, you guys flag it as phishing. That could generate an event, and maybe a week later or so, recorded future sends an alert and says, "We've noticed that there's a new." Uh, uh, um, content associated, you know, you can enrich the event. So recorded future can be very proactive in the additional context that we can provide, as well as a workflow can be set up in a way that is updating uh, the risk score or the risk evidence that we have uh, as well. Perfect. I'm I'm going to jump on to a little bit. Um, I'm going to follow up on that um, on, on Rick's side of it, because that ties into what I talked about on the pipeline side of, of of D3. So let's say that's exactly the case in terms of that that IOC ends up evolving. And let's say that we've dismissed a bunch of events that have come in because that IOC is benign. Maybe that IP address for the first while is just low. We're not we're not going to deal with it. As those items come in and we've dismissed them, we don't delete them out of the system. So let's say two weeks later that same IOC comes in, but now it's got a high risk you can actually backfill that information into, into a case or an incident based on the dismissed events. So you can always pull those dismissed ones out and pull them into cases based on updated intelligence that's coming from a quarter future. So 
there, there's ways you can utilize that those those items uh, those items as well. Um, Alex, there was one other question that popped up quick that I did want to I did want to answer in terms of um, somebody said they were unsure as to how the risk risk leveling was done within D3. So this is based on the IOC coming into the uh, coming into the environment. So I think it was I think it was Jose that asked that question. So based on the artifact behavior that's been pulled out from that event, we can adjust the risk leveling of that that event based on the based on the artifact behavior that's coming into the system and whether or not something's risky or not. There's actually multiple ways that we can adjust this risk leveling at both the event level and the case level. So I wanted to make sure I covered that question. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Perfect. Those are uh, fantastic questions. Um, any others before I kind of it's it's kind of funny because we we <laughs> we went uh we 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 kind of went uh through to like essentially the Q&A side of the uh of of the item uh, right away. Uh from from the from the point of maybe I'll just cover the last part of the demo which I think we 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 did um most of it uh, already within uh, with within the platform here. So on these particular items, if I'm looking at the if I'm looking at the playbook side of things, uh, it really comes down to whatever types of actions uh, we we want to do at that point. So depending on how much control uh, you have over the environment, this might be a ticket into a ticketing system to tell people they've got to update their block block rules or they want to go ahead and uh, you know. Maybe it's a thing off to IT to quarantine items, or if the if the security team has got full control, uh, they can actually do these items automatically within with, within the environment as well. And then right back to generating a full report at the end of the at the end of the incident. So uh, the workflow side from D three can handle the 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 entire end to end portion of it. So with that, I think I'll, I'll go back onto the PowerPoint. We kind of already had a a bit of a Q and A, which I which I think is fantastic. But uh, we'll open up to see if there's uh, if there's any more. Yeah, I think Jose is asking a question. Uh, ticket system. Uh, I guess he's asking if there's integrations with ticketing systems. Yeah. So any uh, Jira, ServiceNow, Remedy, uh, take your pick, uh, Jose. If if it's got an API, we can we, we can tap into it. That that that's that's sort of our blanket statement on on that side of it. Um, so yeah, it could be pretty much anything that's got an API. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Maybe polling the the participants. Uh, are there any particular uh, integrations you guys would like to see or workflows? Uh, because that could influence our, our next sessions, right? So if you guys want to share that information, that would be that would be great. Uh, and while we're waiting for that, uh, Stan, do you uh, do you see many integrations with uh, something like a like a Slack or Microsoft Teams? Yeah, that's a great one. So uh, we we get that a lot in terms of teams that have to go through approval or escalation procedures. Um, we, if it's, it's kind of the same thing as a ticketing system, we can actually send a notification to like a private Teams channel to have people approve actions uh, or updates um, or different things. It could be Slack, it could be Teams. Again, anything with an API that we can utilize for communications, we can go and send information through. And and that's that's not just like a yes or no type item. Like we could send we could send intelligence information from a quarter future into that into that Teams channel so that people actually have context for what they're what they're approving or or what they may need to look at. That's a great question, Lewis. Yeah, uh, we have had uh, much a lot of interest from customers looking to integrate our intelligence with um, some of those communication tools to, to make decisions on the fly and do enrichment uh, or even provide linkages mm -hmm. to our intelligence card. Yep. So, I've got uh, five more questions and we've got about 11 more minutes and I'm sure a few more will come in. So let me just uh, do some uh, quick hitters here. Um, what use cases does the integration support beyond enrichment? I know you guys touched on that a little bit, but you know, a little bit more specificity, I think would be great. How much do we want to give away? <laughs> 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 um, I, I think, uh, so I'll, um, and Lewis can probably go ahead and, and, and give, a, give some additional context around this, but um, Recorder Future's got an amazing uh, capability to have, uh, you know, we talked about like C and C server lists and other things that that are available, and that's part of the integration. So, from a proactive standpoint, uh, you can set up a schedule to grab those, uh, you know, known bad domains or known bad um, IP lists uh, proactively and actually push them into your into your firewalls and other areas 
um, in an auto in, in a proactive automatic fashion, uh, utilizing utilizing the, the integrations that uh, that we have between Recorded Future and D three. Yeah. Uh, Lewis, do you want to uh, add anything, or, or should I uh, ask the next yeah. one? So I would say stay tuned for for next <laughs> workshops. Uh, we Recorded Future out of the box supports. Um, we provide intelligence in what we call modules, uh, and that is, you know, threat intelligence, security operation intelligence, geopolitical intelligence, third-party intelligence, vulnerability intelligence, brand intelligence, identity intelligence, card fraud intelligence, attack surface intelligence. So every one of those modules has different use cases that we can support uh, and different components where we can be proactive. Um, so to give you a, a small uh, sample, um, somebody asked about phishing. One of the things that we can do in Recorded Future with our brand intelligence module is that we can alert whenever we detect a typo squat domain. So if a company has a lookalike domain uh, that, that we identify, we can say, okay, uh, D3 security, here's an alert. D3 security can generate an event. Um, and as we are monitoring that event, we have something that we call uh, playbook alerts uh, or workflow alerts, where we would monitor that uh, lookalike domain and say, is there content that is infringing on your, on your copyrights, on your digital content being uh, shown or exposed uh, in, this, um, in this type of squad domain? Do they have an MX record associated? Have they registered a certificate? All of that evidence that would be needed to do a takedown. We also offer takedown services um, where D3 can say, okay, record a feature, go ahead and, and take down this, this domain. So there's a workflow for where we can proactively take down phishing domains um, even before your customers are, are bombarded. Uh, so that's a, a small example. And every one of those modules, for example, the brand module supports uh, 43 different use cases out of the box. And I can go on and on. So there's a lot that we can help to automate. That's why D3 is an excellent partner where we can take the components um, that we have of each of the modules or that intelligence, deliver it via the API and enrich uh, any number of workflows and, and automate and, and demonstrate the value of the partnership uh, by very quickly showing that, that ROI. Based on the number of events we're automating, here's how much money uh, your team is saving. So to build the justification. So that's, th th there's a good synergy between the two companies. Absolutely. Uh, Alex, um, it looks like we had another question here in the, in the chat. Yeah. Um, so, you want to address that one, Dan? Yeah. So um, if I'm just going to uh, preface this, are you talking like live synchronization between two tools um, or are you talking, uh, I guess, um, like an asynchronous? Uh, live. Okay. Yeah. So, like, let's use um, let's use something like ServiceNow. We'll take it as a like a ticketing solution or other security solutions. Uh, we do have an option called ongoing surveillance within a within a playbook. So that allows you to monitor things um, within a playbook in a live situation. So if there's an update to a ticket or if there's update to something else, that can be reflected back into a D3 case or a playbook. Um, it's the only uh, the only side of that that I would say is a requirement is that um, you know we enable a bi-directional integration between those security solutions. So the, the short answer there is yes. There, there there's multiple probably ways that we can do live changes as well as asynchronous um, updates between between tools on that side. Uh, here here's another question: Is the integration bi-directional? Can D three update recorded future? Yeah, so there's there's ways that we can go and write information back into Recorded Future and update uh, update items there uh, as well. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, this one's for Stan. How long does it take to build a typical enrichment playbook? Are there pre-built playbooks for enrichment available in the D3 platform? Yeah, so there's some that are that are pre-built into the system, but honestly, to build an enrichment playbook, uh, probably would take minutes within the system to simply go and drag and drop the items in there and then point it towards the data sources within within the environment. So it's we supply training. We don't ever just drop the tool on people. There's there's training, there's walkthroughs. We've got a client portal for on-demand training on that side of it. 
but uh, to build an to build a play an enrichment playbook out would take minutes within within the system. Hmm. Stan, what are the most common use cases uh, for SOAR in general? So you know the use cases that that you see in your customers that you work with. So I think Lewis um, actually you know touched on on some of those already within within the within the space. So things like phishing is a is a big one that it's still the number one attack vector out there, even though we hear a lot of stuff to do with ransomware. But I think if you look at the amount of money that is lost due to like B, uh, BEC and and phishing items, it tends to be probably the number one um, within within the environment. Um, and to be able to take workflows, we've helped clients um, take their their phishing workflows from 25 minutes because we integrate the uh, tend to be um, really large when it comes to helping security teams just just become faster and get through get through the noise better. Um, you know, malware alerts tend to be another big one that 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 comes through on the on the EDR side of it. And sometimes it's just it's getting an alert that simply needs to be vetted and and closed out uh, because it's it, it's it's a false positive. And that those are items that we that we tend to help with as well. So hopefully, Alex, does that answer that question? Hopefully, yeah, I, I believe it does, Stan. Um, Uh, Stan, can D3 take automated action based on intelligence? So I, I I guess they're talking about a threat that's been validated to a high degree. Can D3 take action uh, autonomously through the playbook? Yeah. Like let's let's go back through what Lewis said. Like if 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 they're if you're monitoring uh, typo squatting on that side of it and the intelligence comes through and it's and you know it's vetted and it's high. Um, you know, trust your security tool and automate that process. Maybe ones that are more in the medium uh, area, that's when you want an analyst to kind of get in there and, you know, use the human side of it. Uh, but yeah, if it's, if in that, even in that playbook that I showcased, um, if you're vetting on critical, high, low, medium, or whatever type of scale you're using, um, you can go ahead and automate those processes completely within the system. You don't have to have a human um, involved if you're, if you're comfortable and you, and you vetted the process correctly. Okay, thanks, Stan. Um, I'm excited with how many questions uh, we were able to address, and I appreciate the uh, the audience's engagement. Um, some fantastic questions. Um, you know, several are deserving of of the fifty dollar GC, so it'll make our our uh, our uh, selection process difficult. I'm sure we'll argue about it a little bit, but that's that's a good sign. Um, we have two minutes left, so if you have any questions, um, you know, now's the time to ask them. Uh, while we await any final questions, you know, I, I just want to talk openly about uh, the new year. Um, Stan, Lewis, you have referenced a few times uh, future workshops, and I just want to confirm we are working on some future workshops uh, in the new year. Uh, so, you know, everybody that's uh, on this call right now, um, the audience, you're all uh, signed up for D3 emails. You know, if, if you've uh, signed up for this webinar, you're receiving our um, our newsletters and we will obviously be reaching out in the new year with the future workshops. So we'd love to see you um, on those. Uh, you can always come to d3security.com uh, uh, to request a demo, to see what's happening with D3. Um, you can email us at marketing at d3security.com or sales at d3security.com. Um, you know, Al, uh, Stan and myself, you know, welcome uh, you to uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's about D3. But Lewis, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Recorded Future, how people can get in touch with you, mm -hmm. how to check out your software, that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, well... Obviously, th through the partnership, if you guys mentioned to the team, if you're already working with D3 Security, uh, we work very closely together with the Tech Alliance team. Uh, but recordedfuture.com is a, is a good point uh, to start. Uh, there you can sign up for uh, request a free trial or contact sales. So that's probably the best way uh, to contact us as well, if you want to contact us directly. Perfect. 
And Thanks, Bruce. We did get Stan, one more. We, we, uh, a question. Yeah. Uh, in the function. That's a great question. And, it's a great and, question. Uh, yeah. So, fun. yeah. So, um, within the case management side of it, there's an audit trail for everything that's done within within the system, Rick. So if I'm uh, if I'm an analyst and I'm running, um, you know, I decided to do an ad hoc check because even though I showed just the workflow side of it, if I decide to go in and let's say I I want to manually query um, recorder future from D3, that gets logged as to who did it, when they did it, um, and and the information that that comes in. Anything that's changed in there, whether it's a note, um, whether it's a file that's added, um, those are all things that are tracked and logged as part of, as part of the audit trail within the within the environment. Uh, Art, real. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, Lewis. No, go ahead. Finish. Okay. I thought you so, were finished. Um, real quick, a certain artifacts and pieces of evidence can be locked from editing. Yeah. So you have control as to who you can allow into the artifact side of it and not, and, and who has edit capabilities within the artifact. So I can do the role control side of D3. I can say, okay, I, these people can view the associated artifacts with a case, but they can't edit them. So those are controls that, that are uh, capability within, within the tool. So hopefully that answers the question there for you. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Lewis. I just wanted to comment something really powerful that came to mind. Let's say in the in the use case that Rick described uh, for forensics analysis, um, let's say you know there's a, an attacker that does support scanning and that flags and you guys capture it as an event. Um, obviously, you can download information and you have it into an event. Um, and that could be a workflow with D3 where you guys can correlate other events mentions. But in recorded feature, because of the way to way communication, uh, you can also write an analyst note so that if you know a year or two years from now um, something happens and you see that that IOC again, uh, there's a correlation. So those are some really cool things um, because some people go on vacation, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> uh, so Perfect. That could be That's a useful a, useful yeah. thing. It's another good question, Rick. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was a great question. And, and again, thanks to everybody um, for the volume and, and quality of questions. Absolutely. Oh, did Alex freeze? I think I think he did. <laughs> yeah, so, Alex may have frozen. Well, just in time. Uh, just in time. So I will say thank you to everybody uh, from, from D3 side of it. Lewis, thank you so much for, uh, for joining on this workshop. Uh, we're looking forward to doing more in the future. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. We'll wish everybody a fantastic holiday season. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for coming.